You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, the podcast where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, the PR firm that specializes in music tech and innovation. Hey, I try to talk to our next guest about once every decade. I met him on a tiny street in the Lower East Side of New York. I remember walking down to a basement room in a retrofitted office with narrow hallways lined with CDs. It kind of reminded me of a former like crowded tenement building. The street was Orchard Street. I was peddling my music PR services. I literally went to New York to do that. And there were two of the nicest people I had yet to meet in the music industry, Richard Goderer and our guest, Scott Cohen, founders of The Orchard, one of the earliest digital distributors, which they sold to Sony. And in 2019, Scott took on the role of chief innovation officer at Warner Music Group. And in the latter half of 2022, stepped down from that role. In December of 2022, this past year, Scott started a new royalties venture called Jukebox. We want to hear all about it. Welcome to Music Tectonic, Scott Cohen. <laughs> Great to be here. And, and we've definitely talked more than once a <laughs> decade, but, but it's incredible. You're one of the few people that actually visited the offices in those early days and still understand what we were doing as the first distributor of digital music on the web in the mid to late 90s. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood what you were doing at the time, <laughs> but I knew you were uh, doing something. <laughs> To, to be honest, I, we weren't sure what we were doing at the time. We were making it up as we go. It was, you know, there was no, um, there was no path forward. There was, you know, it was like a compass that there's this web and we're heading towards something, but nobody had done any of it. So we were just going with the flow. Yeah. What year did you guys move out of that, that office on the orchard? Do you remember on orchard street? Uh, what year? So we, we started we in 97. Moved. Yeah, we started in 97. We stayed there a few years and we thought we really made it. We, we moved up to um, Fifth Avenue between 19th and 20th. That was, that was great. The Fifth Avenue office was great. We I've never been like we there. Made it. Then we moved up to 100 Park Avenue and really made it. And then um, we got so big, we actually moved back downtown. Oh, interesting. I was just trying and, to think. And I then we were also often, uh, opening offices all around the world as well. Yeah. I started Rock, Paper, Scissors in 99, and I have a hunch it was that first year when we met there for the first time. Anyway, hey, given your leadership roles at The Orchard and Warner Music, which is quite a, quite a different perspective, how would you characterize this moment in time for the music industry? How is it different from the distant past and the recent past? Well, I, I, I think I always think of it that, that, that it's an exciting time. But it's always an exciting time to be in the music business because it's always a business in flux. You know, people really think it's a business that's the same stodgy old business, but it's never been the same. I, some people that have heard me speak before say, you know, it's constantly changing. I can think of, you know, we have, uh, you know, go back to the late 60s and it was like all this new technology around albums an FM radio and color TV, because in the decade before that, in the 50s, it was black and white TV, AM radio, and singles. So we went from that to albums, FM, color TV. But then we move into the 70s, and it changed again. It was all about the cassette and the portability of music. You move into the 80s, then the CD is introduced, and nobody cares about cassettes or vinyl anymore. MTV launches. You go into the 90s, the web launches get into the first decade of the 2000s and all of a sudden the iTunes store comes and nobody wants CDs because we can pay for downloads. You have the very beginnings of, you know, Facebook and YouTube, but then you get into the second decade of the 2000s and then it's all about streaming. Who wants to download when you can stream? Social media takes off. You get into now this third decade and now it's about web three. It's TikTok. You know, it's ever changing and and that's what's so exciting about it. it it's not staying the same it seems like the change is actually more rapid now i mean it seems like i've been looking at some some data you know in the in the mid late 70s it was like you had vinyl eight tracks and cassettes mm -hmm. <laughs> and then at some point i think in the it must have been in the 90s where these new categories popped up i mean obviously 
uh, eight tracks disappeared. Cassettes took over vinyl. CDs appeared. CDs, di- C- uh, vinyl didn't di- ever disappear. People love to say that it never disappeared. <laughs> um, never uh, but CDs started to take over more and more. Then downloads came- appeared, started to take over. Then streaming appeared. But now it's like there was a point where ringtones, there was a category called other that showed up. We saw the growth in sync. Um, and now there's, you know, I think, uh, you know, NFTs and so forth. It seems like change is happening more quickly now and that there's more. There's more uh, flavors of the way that music's getting listened to. Maybe, maybe. I, I mean, I don't know that the pace of change has increased. It's, it's always felt this fast and dynamic, at least to me. And and you know, you just rattled off a bunch of things, and I did too. That you know came and went, and fads that came and went because there was also different types of formats and companies, and they all came and went. Um, it's just part of the world we live in that keeps it exciting you know and we haven't even talked about the changes in music but just the business right, and the right. industry around it have, have, have been in flux it's true the the diversity and variations in styles and and genres and scenes and voices and regions it's super interesting yeah. i mean imagine you know 10 or 20 years ago saying you know some of the biggest acts in the world would be from south korea singing in Korean and, and Latin artists singing in Spanish. And like, I mean, it seems pretty obvious now, but 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been obvious. Yeah. Yeah. It's super fun to keep an eye on all these shifts that are happening. Another shift I'm curious about from the trade magazines and industry news, it appears from the outside that Warner has been leaning in with web three and gaming with partnerships and investments. I know you're not there anymore, but do you think that sort of thing that, that sort of uh, change trend uh, was simply in response to organic growth that resulted from isolation during the pandemic, or is there something bigger happening in society that makes these shifts relevant going forward? No, I, well, well, certainly from the Warner perspective, and I don't speak for Warner, but they're, they were very forward thinking, um, particularly around web three. And it was part of an active strategy. I mean, I came in, you know, before the pandemic, before any of that in 2019, um, and that is one of the reasons I came on was talking about blockchain and NFTs before it became a thing and, and web three and gaming and, and, and truly at, at Warner, it's, it's, it's Juana, Juana Roxandra, who's leading the charge on that. And she's amazing. And they're all in on, on, on where it's going. It's part of a, a larger strategy because this is part of the future. You know, it's funny you should bring that up because you and I had a, con- we, we don't speak only once a decade. A, 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 I think it was a couple of years ago, you and I had a conversation. We were talking about maybe doing a piece on music and blockchain and we never could get it through the comms <laughs> approval process, which I understand. But I, I asked you about whether blockchain will change the music industry. And at that time you said, it's not a matter of if, but when. And that really, that really struck me. I was hoping we were going to be able to publish that somewhere, but we never did. How is your thinking around blockchain changed since that moment, especially since the rise and crash of certain cryptocurrencies. Yeah, it's, it's funny because one, I, re- I remember that, that our conversation and I was really excited about it and we couldn't get corp comps to, to, to green light it. And, and, and that was really right when I started. So that would have been, you know, the early part of 2019. Um, again, way before all of this kind of Web3 crypto blockchain kind of took hold. You yeah. know, I think that, that that happened during the pandemic. It became wider known. And I think that I was spot on and I'm more confident in blockchain technology than ever before. I'm very clear about it. I, you know, what, what, what I'm certain of is that it's still fairly immature the fact that we know about blockchain that if somebody has to know what a crypto wallet is what an nft is an ft a coin a token what's the difference between a coin and a token if you're leading with the technology if it's in the foreground then it's not mature you know it wasn't that long ago that if you wanted to go to a website you had to type in h T, T, P, colon, backslash, backslash, W, 
www.nameofthewebsite.com. I hope it was a .com, not a .net, .org, or anything else. And if you got anything wrong in that, nothing. You just have to start again from the beginning. H T T P. <laughs> and 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 you know that the, the the technology was way in front, and it wasn't that long ago. But in today's world, if I want a car to show up, I push a button. If I want to listen to music, just push a button. If I want, you know, to order food and just arrives at my house, it's a push of a button. I have no idea what coding language they use, what the tech stack is. Like, it's all irrelevant. I have no idea if the technology is actually on the blockchain. That's when you know you get it right. This feels a lot like the dot-com crash of the 90s when, you know, all the tech stocks went sh surging up and there were crazy business ideas, you know, talking about if you get enough eyeballs, your company is worth some multiple of the number of eyeballs you got. And people were throwing around tens and 20, hundred million dollar checks because you had eyeballs and, and people would then go, but how do you make money? And they'd be like, no, it's the web. It's a new economy. You don't understand the, you know, I hear all this with, 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 you know, blockchain technology. Oh, you don't understand. It's transformational. It's this and this. But just like the web crashed, it just cleared the crappy business models and everything else. But the web didn't go away. I mean, and the news was was talking about it. I saw some old YouTube videos with, you know, broadcasters on like network news in America talking about now that it's crashed, we can get back to the real business of, of the world and this fad of the of the internet will go away. And so blockchain feels a lot like that. There was this fad of NFTs in the last couple of years. And now we're in this, uh, well, you know, some people call it the crypto winter. I think crypto ice age is probably closer to what we're in. And when we come out of that, we'll be left with the real value of what the technology can bring. You're saying ice age because you think it's longer than a season. Yeah, I think it's pretty deep and cold. Yeah. It's brutal. <laughs> Gotcha. But, but we'll you know, come winter out of it. is like cold and then, you know, not, doesn't kill anything. You can still go this sledding. Is like, <laughs> this is going to be mean the extinction of, of lots of things. Yeah. Got it. So, um, I have a little side question for you and then we'll take a quick break. Was it weird going from the independent focus of the orchard to working with a major label? And what were the biggest lessons learned from that shift? I mean, it seems like it'd be weird to me. I mean, I love, I love Warner and I love all the innovation there, but it just seems like, uh, it would have, you know, it would have to feel different yeah. to you. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yes. I, I, I mean, I have to just start with, was it weird? Yes. Um, you know, cause I started the orchard with Richard and you visited our basement and our shitty little tenement building and on orchard street and true startup world and building out of there. But over time, you know, we, we had transitioned from a couple of founders at a startup to how do you actually run and operate a business? We had finally brought in some money in the early 2000s, 2003. We brought in like proper staff that knew how to run business, not just like our Motley crew. And I love our Motley crew, but you know, at some point you need people that know how to run a business. And then part of it was sold to Sony and then Sony bought the other half. So. I was there during that kind of growth, you know, in, and, and then when I left in 2019, I mean, my, my, my thought was I'm retiring. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just like 22 years of, you know, building a company. I think that's plenty. I'd done what I needed to do. There was truly nothing more for me. And then I was talking to Max Lusada, the CEO of Warner Music Group. And before I knew it, I was working for him as the chief innovation officer of Warner Music Group. Now, Max is an exceptional leader, a, a truly great CEO at, at Warner Music and led the company into this, into the stratosphere. And I love Max and I, and I loved all the colleagues, you know, everyone I worked with, I loved the work I was doing. But at the end of the day, maybe I prefer building you know, starting at the bottom, being a little scrappier and, and trying something new. And it was, it's truly nothing against Warner. I mean, I, I had a very open conversation with Max um, at the end of the summer saying, I 
think I've made the impact I can make here and perhaps it's time for me to leave. And I still hadn't had anything ready to go into. I, I walked away thinking I'm ready to retire. And then a new opportunity <laughs> presented itself <laughs> like it always does. And they pulled me back in, you know, like, <laughs> You keep, you keep trying to retire. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about why you're not retiring. We'll be right back. Are you cooking up something cool during South by Southwest? Help your music tech friends find your music tech event in Austin this March. Tell us about your panels, meetups, parties, or activations that involve music tech and music innovation. We'll add them to our unofficial guide and spread the word to the Music Tectonics community. There's a link to submit your event on the blog at musictectonics.com or find Music Tectonics on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. The link is in our bio. Want to get your hands on the unofficial guide? Make sure you're signed up for the Music Tectonics newsletter at musictectonics.com. We'll email you when it's ready. Now back to the episode. All right, we're back with Scott Cohen. You've got this new endeavor called Jukebox. It's spelled J-K-B-X. What is Jukebox and how did it come into being? Maybe the way to, to think about it is there's this asset class of music. I mean, and it's been an asset class since, I don't know, since maybe the, you know, the introduction of copyright laws. So it's been around and it's been traded. Um, and, and when we look at it today, you know, there's the multinational corporations, as in the major labels, a bunch of private equity firms. You know, I don't know the number, but a dozen or so, not much more, um, of these large firms that control most of the meaningful um, copyrights of music, in at least in the West. Um, and I thought, that's crazy that that you have this tradable asset class, but it's not actually available to regular people to the, to the general public, you know, which in, in investment terms are called, you know, retail investors. It's not available to the general public. I mean, as, as a member of the general public, if I wanted to buy a share of Apple or Microsoft or Tesla or Amazon, I could buy a share. But if I wanted to buy a share of a Justin Bieber song or a Fleetwood Mac song, impossible, not allowed to. So, I thought that was a bit crazy. I mean, it, in a way, it's not even the newest idea. You know, there was uh, in 97, the, the year we started The Orchard, there was David Bowie did his Bowie bonds with Prudential, where he had a, a, a fit, he raised $55 million with an asset-backed security. And what was that security that backed it? His music royalties. So it's been in the been kind of playing around the last 25, 30 years, but nobody's quite gotten it right. Wow. I didn't know about Bowie Bonds. That's super interesting. I'd have to look that up now. <laughs> yeah. It was a big deal back then. Gotcha. You were too young. You were a kid. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. Um, so, so, so what is Jukebox? That, that sort of sets the background. Yeah. So, so, so think of it as a technology platform where people can buy and trade in music royalties. It's, it's really as simple as that. Like, you know, whether you're a fan or you're a trader, I mean, if you think about maybe what, maybe the way to think about it is the size of the market. Like, what are we talking about here? So, so again, th these numbers are hard to come by, but what's the current thinking on the size of the music market today in terms of how much money is generated from copyrights? 40 billion, something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, anyone can correct me on my math if I'm not right, but I think it's around 40 billion. And when you see catalogs that are being bought and sold, which often make the, the news, like Justin Bieber just made the news for selling his for 200 million. Um, w w when I look at that, uh, you know, I go, okay, so catalogs sell for, I don't know, on the low end around 15 times annual earnings. And on the high end, 25, 30 times how much a song earns. Um, so if we just split the difference and said 20, again, anyone can do whatever math they want, but 20 
times annual earnings of $40 billion means the addressable market is $800 billion. $800 billion. Now, every song isn't going to be available on the stock market to be bought and sold, but even at 10%, that's $80 billion, which is double the size of the music industry. Um, so that's pretty massive. I think, I think if we look at it also from the demand side, so that's how much supply there is. There's a lot of music. There's a great opportunity to, to allow regular people to own pieces of songs. If we then looked at the demand side, so in America, there's something like 80 million individual investment accounts. So people have like, I don't know, Schwab account or a Fidelity account or a Merrill Lynch or Robin Hood, you know, those where they buy, oh, I'll buy 10 shares of Amazon, I'll buy 10 shares of Apple, you know, where people put things in their, their own accounts. We're not talking about institutional. So there's 80 million of those accounts. And on average, they trade $13.8 billion every day, every day. Now, I'm not, again, I, I'm going to do some math. Uh, j j just for context, I, I, I got my degree in psychology, so I'm better at explaining how you might feel about numbers than actually calculating numbers. But if there's 13.8 billion traded every day, you don't trade every day because stock markets close on weekends and holidays. So let's just say times 250 days of trading a year, you're, you're, you're in the realm of three and a half trillion dollars, three and a half trillion dollars that individuals are buying small amounts of stock. Well, if they would buy five shares of, of I don't know, Tesla, why not buy five shares of Justin Bieber? or The Weeknd, or any other artist, Janet Jackson, you know, like, I'm just trying to throw out some, you know, examples. Like, I think that's a huge opportunity for, for people to get in there and, and, and buy music. I think that the, the demand is there. So maybe, maybe, maybe I'll explain a little deeper. So, right. so, so, so what we built here is essentially a trading platform that's going to launch for these rights. So you can go in, it's, it's, it's um, regulated by the SEC. We believe these are securities, just like stock on the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange or the FTSE in the UK. These are securities and they should be treated as such. And so you can go on there, you, there's full disclosures, everything you would do to IPO a company, we do that at the song level. And is that the, uh, that would be like the publishing royalties, the composition side, or is there also the label master side as well? It, 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 it's both. It's all. There, there's, there's multiple royalties that can be fractionalized and then securitized and then offered up to the public. So it could be the songwriter royalties, the publisher royalties, the master recordings. And we'll, and so where we are today is we've already secured um, catalogs that, that total over $1.7 billion that will, that will um, launch on our catalog. Uh, $1.7 billion dollars in terms of royalties? In terms of the value, value. of those. Okay. Got it. And then, you know, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I think by the end of the spring or certainly by the time we launch in September, we should have somewhere between four and five billion dollars wow. that we could offer up to the public, and these will be mean that you you know it'll have a kind of breadth and depth of catalog on there, so new stuff, old stuff, but all things people would know, named artists, hit songs that that you either know from current times or or harkens back to when you were a kid, all big stuff. Um, that, are you cur you're curating who comes onto the platform? I mean, you say if some indie artist that hasn't sold much or doesn't have much royalties, evidence of future royalties, uh, would they be able to sell there? Or doubtful, okay, doubtful in in version one because remember these when you're doing a, a filings with the SEC to create a security to sell. I mean, 
that is no small undertaking. It's, it takes a lot of time, six to nine months of filings and a lot of money. So it doesn't make sense at that, at that point. There is a path forward for the independents later. Ooh, it. It's absolutely on our roadmap how we can bundle some, some smaller assets and, and to create a larger asset that people could invest in. Um, yeah, and so, so, so that's what we're working on. It sounds super cool. And you make a really compelling case for the potential, the potential there, um, on, on a lot of different levels, both, both in terms of the, the rights holders and a new monetization opportunity, uh, a way to reinvest in what they're doing, uh, depending on whether they're an artist or a, or a company. Um, but then also for fans to not only engage, but actually profit from that engagement as well. Um, not to get too far into into the weeds here, but um, uh, I'm I'm curious. You, you mentioned that it could be a multiple types of of rights in terms of what royalties come back. So if somebody comes, to, say a record label comes to you and says, "Yeah, let's do this," and maybe they have publishing for some of their songs and they don't for others, they can in, on each song basis they can individually choose what they're able to offer and offer it through your platform. Yeah, and that that, that that's it. I you know. The, the, the way it works, if we're going to get in a little bit into the weeds, but not too deep, the rights holder will continue to own the copyright. Um, this is about the royalties they make from that copyright. So, so by maintaining the ownership of the copyright, it means they maintain you know, all the decision making around that song. Um, so, so what happens is we'll set up a new entity for them. We'll call it, it's an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. It could be, a, you know, a, an LLC. It could be a C corp. It could be a trust. It's irrelevant what it is, but they'll take some portion of the royalty stream that will go into this new company. So, so no one needs to to, to list an entire song. You could say, I'll take twenty percent of it and IPO it. So you put, you do a letter of direction. So twenty percent of those royalty streams flow into this new company. And what people do is af after we file with, with the regulators and, and do the public offering, they actually buy a share in that new company. The business of that new company is only those royalties from that song or that artist or that catalog. And then they can buy and, tr and, and sell those, um, those shares, but those shares also become dividend bearing. So if the only business of the company is to collect the royalties at some point, whether it's monthly or quarterly or annually, the company fills up with money and go, well, time to declare a dividend and pay the shareholders. So they become royalty participants. I see this path as making a lot of sense, especially when you think about the type of regulation. Taking the corporate structure, the company structure, which is the basis of how stocks operate, you're just basically creating that structure as a business for a subset of royalties, and then people are investing in that business that is responsible for those royalties. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Wow, makes a lot of sense. Hey, um, you talked about the potential market size. You made a great pitch here. Like, where do I sign up? I'm going to start buying music, guys. Um, why hasn't something like this taken off yet? Well, like I said, you know, it's been tried over 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 the decades. You know with Bowie, but that was institutional. There's companies right now doing it. I, I, I think there's three key factors um, that we focus on that, um, that, that, that are necessary for success. One is scale. You have to do it with a large enough catalog of music so that when people are on the platform, they can say, well, do you have a piece of that? Yeah. Do you have this? Yep. Oh, and, and oh, you can find things. Right now, I've seen a lot of people do drops, you know, very web three, boom, drop. You can have one. The other is this regulatory framework, I think, is critical. Everything we do is in a regulatory wrapper and, 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 and really making this real. This isn't, you know, we're not focused on is it an NFT or not an NFT? It's no. Is this following the rules and regulations, is it anchored to a real asset in the real world? Does it pay? So we think the regulatory framework is key. And then the third is the retail investors, the, 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 the regular people that buy stock with their individual retirement accounts need or individual investment accounts 
need to be able to participate in this. And, and it's nobody has ever achieved all three. I, I, I would even say nobody's ever attempted all three. So they've attempted one or two elements, but nobody's put that it has to happen at scale. You have to have a regulatory framework and you have to bring it to, to, the, to the general population to participate in. Awesome. We've talked about your past. Now we've talked about your present and we come back from this next break. Let's talk about your future. We'll be right back. Shaylee here with big news from the Music Tectonics team. The Music Tectonics Conference returns October 24th through 26th, 2023. We're organizing three amazing days in Santa Monica, California. Save the dates for high energy panels, insightful keynotes, a startup pitch competition, innovative exhibitors, networking, and more. We'll be returning to some of the fun beachside venues our attendees loved last year and adding some new unexpected places and experiences. Early bird tickets go on sale April 24th. A limited number of super early bird discount tickets will be available. Sign up to get notified when they go on sale at musictectonics.com. You'll get updated on the music tech and innovation programming we're planning for this year's conference and insider details. Is your company ready to take center stage at the conference? Let's talk about sponsorship opportunities. There's a contact form at musictectonics.com. See you in California, October 24th through 26th. Now back to the episode. Awesome. So great to hear of everything you're doing with uh, with Jukebox, Scott. Um, before we move into the real future, like the real far off future, you talked about the potential market size of this new asset class. How long is it going to take to get there? Oh, um, this, is, this has always been my Achilles heel. It's why I started a dis digital distribution company in the mid 90s before there was anyone to distribute to. Like we, when we started in 97 and iTunes didn't launch until March of uh 2003. So been not so good on timelines. <laughs> With that said, I actually, we're launching in September. I actually believe there's going to be immediate consumer demand for this. And then it just grows from there. I, I, I think that what I'm doing different this time is following the second mouse gets the cheese philosophy. So I've watched a lot of mice get caught in the trap. <laughs> Um, and so I learned from them. What, what, what are the other businesses that have tried this? What, what have they done wrong? And what have they done right? And taken both of those and created this. And I think that's, that's my hope. So my hope is the end of this year, we'll actually see some significant demand. Do you think this is the future? Uh, the, do you think the future of music investment is by the masses? And I'm curious if we get there, what impact will this have on traditional labels and publishers? Yeah, uh, it's it's absolutely the future. I'm, I'm sure of of opening up to the masses is the future. That that's exactly why I'm doing it. I think it this is something that's transformational, not substitutional which is really important to me. I think we're going to unlock trap value in these assets without disrupting any part of the existing music industry ecosystem. Whereas when we talked earlier, we said, you know, all the things that replaced it, you know, albums replaced singles and cassettes replaced albums and CDs replaced those and, and so on and so on. This doesn't replace anything. This doesn't cannibalize any part of our industry. It doesn't substitute anything. This creates value on top. And I think this is what gets me so interested in that. Um, was that I, I, now I don't even remember what the question was. Oh, but, well, you, I think you started to answer, yes, this is the future of investment, but what's the impact on traditional labels and publishers of, of this future form of investment? Yeah, just like a company that IPOs, you know, they offer part of their company on the public market and then that transforms them. They, instead of just taking the money they get month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year, they, 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 when they IPO, they take some, some multiple of that. And by bringing that money in, they can fund their operations to grow bigger, faster, better. So this is what this could unlock could be for record labels that are essentially just generating money 
month over month from currently it's streaming services and everything else, just they collect their money. But what could it mean if they could unlock some of the value of those copyrights that are sitting in their catalogs by getting 20 times multiples on them? I mean, it's really interesting to me that you're launching this at this time when the, the majors um, are talking about uh, how they have to adjust to this tidal wave of independent music. Um, which you, you were a part of unlocking. Yes. <laughs> it's like you're moving up the value chain in, in, in a way, Scott. But um, uh, that that's become more and more exponential as we hear every every two months. It goes from 40,000 to 60,000 tracks to 100,000 tracks getting released yeah. every day on Spotify, whatever it is. But it, and, and now AI is coming too and mobile, mobile music making. So now we're going to unlock more creators and the robots. There's going to be even more music. But yeah. really, I mean, what you're sort of saying is the, the folks that have solid catalog that has value in the copyright that's been proven to known are also going to get basically a new investment fund to figure out what to do next in music. It might be, this might be their next battleground of how, how to save market share. Yeah. I, I'll throw one other piece out there because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in sharing the wealth as well. So one of the things that we're doing is, you know, as we're creating this primary marketplace and a secondary marketplace where people can trade, just like, you know, we look at it as if you were a, a, a tech company, you IPO on NASDAQ. But if you're, if, you, if you're a music catalog and you have music rights, you do that on Jukebox. So we will generate significant money for those catalog owners which is great. But the other thing we're going to do is we're creating a large pool of money that we'll be able to share with the, the songwriters and the recording artists. Because you have to imagine, for us to do this, it means they've already sold their rights. A publisher has them or a record label has them. So, you know, when we're talking about Justin Bieber, he sold his rights last week. So if we were to sell shares in it, he's not getting anything. So we're saying, even though this is not a royalty bearing event, we have no contractual obligation with anybody. We're creating a pool of money to share with those creators. We think it's the right thing to do. If people are trading in music rights, even if we don't have to pay anyone, we think songwriters and recording artists should get paid. Amazing. Got it. Great. So you've got phase one and phase two already ready to go in terms of labels and then artists. Um, one last question on this topic, and then we're going to broaden out with a couple of future looking questions. After that happens, how will it impact the sound of music, Scott? I don't know that it impacts the sound at all. I mean, maybe it does. I don't, I don't know how it does, but it definitely will impact artists because when I think back, you know, from how the music business was in the 50s and 60s and 70s and very kind of idealistic and almost immature to how the music artists were in the 80s, 90s, and now in the 2000s, where they moved from being just artists to thinking of themselves as small businesses and, and they think about their image and their brand, talking very much like companies. I think the next phase is as they become public company, so to speak, they will take on that, that aspect as well. Now that their rights are being traded on an, on an open marketplace, they'll begin to adopt some of the same language, some of the same, some of the same um, actions that, that any company would do, the way that they already adopted the language and, and actions of, 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 of private companies in today's world. Well, I'm going to push it one step further, Scott, because I think we've watched, we, you know, from the beginning of this podcast, we talked about these historical moments with format shifts and additional revenue streams and, and that. And so we, you know, we've all heard people talk about, well, songs are this long because of vinyl and songs are that long because of CDs or, or albums are that long because of CDs. And now um, people only listen to 30 seconds because of TikTok and so forth. But what I'm hearing you say, like, they might get a whole new revenue stream that's unlocked from the format 
of the 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 of the platform of music listening or engagement of the day and as exactly. a result they may get more freedom about how long a song should be or what a song is so Absolutely. it'll be interesting to see where that goes so um we've t- we've talked about um some pretty future f- focused stuff but here on music tectonics on many episodes we do something where we like to get sci-fi <laughs> So what will the music industry look like 10 to 20 years from today, Scott? I know we've talked, I mean, I know you've got your, your mind, not your hands necessarily, but your mind is covering lots of different spaces in, in music based on the past two big roles you've had and where you're going now. But let's broaden out beyond jukebox. Where do you think things will go 10 to 20 years? What are the crazy sci-fi stuff? Yeah, I mean, I still think it's going to be about songs and I still think it's going to be about artists. Um, you know, what, what, what's interesting is, you know, the benefit of music as a, as, a, as a form of media, as a form of entertainment, it was always this, this entertainment that you could experience while doing something else, that it, that, it, that it could be in the background when you worked out in the gym, when you were driving your car, you couldn't go to the cinema while you were driving your car, you couldn't play a video game while you're lifting weights. You couldn't do that while you're at work. So music was always this amazing, had this amazing kind of side benefit of something you could do while you're doing something else. The problem we have today is the background has moved to the foreground and the foreground has moved to the background. And the primary use case seems to be music as background. And often people you know, like a song, but they don't know the artist or the album or the context around it, nor do they care. So one of the hopes is that we can bring music a bit more into the foreground again. And and we've definitely seen bits of it, you know, with some of the pop acts like BTS, where, you know, the the BTS army goes crazy for, for BTS. But I think that's something that hopefully we we move toward that's not something i am predicting but that's something i'm hoping we can bring that back to the foreground i still think you know uh people will complain about music whether it's artists always complain sorry artists but you always complain you know why is elvis big and not me in the 1950s like i play better rock and roll than him whatever or or listeners complain like the music that you're listening to is crap. When I was a kid, it was real music, you know, and that 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 keeps going. Um, so 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 I think people will still think the system is unfair, that things should be back the way it used to be, but it won't. So where will it go? I I, I definitely think you'll see a lot more AI in music. Um, some of it'll be some of it's already happening. A lot of it's happening, and people just don't know it, which also means it's quite mature. Um, You'll see things like synthetic artists, which I think are really cool. Um, you, you know, we've had real world examples of that with, with, with you know, uh, David Bowie, you know, born, born, you know, David Jones, then went by Davy Jones, but there was another Davy Jones in the monkey. So he changed his name to David Bowie. <laughs> and then when, as soon as he got comfortable with David Bowie, he was Ziggy Stardust. And, you know, so, <laughs> Early so, avatars, you know, like, huh? Right. So, so I think there's this whole movement of what do we consider an artist? Does it have to be fully organic and for, fully real that we can have synthetic artists that we can create? Um, I think platforms will change. They'll be much more immersive, which will bring the music to the foreground. That instead of just passively listening only, we'll be in to, to, to not just participatory, but contributory. That, that audiences will be able to so to speak, play along and contribute to music and, and that will, will, will drive it forward. And that I think in 20 years is, 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 is a, is a nice place to be. Nice. Love it. Okay. One last thing. We always try to build network at Music Tectonics, build community. Music Tectonics always asks who are two thought leaders we should be paying attention to and what are two music innovation companies you'd like to shout out? Hmm. Let's think. So for thought leaders, well, certainly I love Scott Galloway, has absolutely nothing to do with music, but I always think of thinking of thought leaders in in other industries that help you kind of crystallize thinking in your own business. Uh, a, a classic like Seth Godin. Yeah, I mean, I love him. come on, you can't 
get better than Seth as a thought leader. Like I read him every single day and every single day there's a little tidbit of like, hmm, yeah, brilliant. Um, and then even as, a, as, a, as maybe a, you said too, but like a bonus. We'll take a bonus. The answer <laughs> would be Bob Lefsitz. I mean, if you're, if you're into the music business or the business of music, then Bob. You got to follow the less it's letter. Like <laughs> cool. What so about a couple of companies? I'm a legend. <laughs> yeah. 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 What about a couple of companies we haven't talked about and then we'll wrap up. So, so, so it's hard because I see hundreds, if not thousands of startups and tech companies, a couple that, that, that I think are doing interesting things. Um, there's a company out of the Netherlands called, uh, copyright Delta. Hmm. This, unbelievably smart guy, Dan Archer, Dan D-A-A-N-A-A, D-A-A-N Archer. Um, and he uses blockchain to solve the unsexy issues of the music industry. Like everyone wants to be out in front, but you know, there's a lot of kind of plumbing that needs to be done around data and digital identities and creating industry standards and following the value chain. And how can that be optimized using blockchain technology, yet completely invisible to the users because it's irrelevant what technology is being used? I love what he's doing. So copyright Delta, one of my favorites. And then there's a little startup um, that I love called Grammarphone. Um, Grammarphone. This uh, the founder is Ali Reza, um, and it's 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 how do I describe it? It's a live streaming application for I don't know musicians, DJs, producers that streams audio to any platform on high with high quality audio. So you don't need any other. You don't need any hardware. You don't need any software. You just use this, and you can live stream to TikTok or YouTube or Twitch or. Facebook or Mixcloud and I don't know how many other platforms. And I just absolutely love what they do. The simplicity of it, again, taking something fairly complex and then making it to the user seamless and easy. You don't do anything. You just log in and stream and everything else is taken care of. Awesome. You've just listened to possibly the best Music Tectonics episode we've had. Scott Cohen, this has been amazing. If people want to find out more about Jukebox, JKBX, where do they go? Um, you can go to the website. Um, I don't even know what our website is. We're so new. Um, you can email me. You can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, MySpace. I don't know where I'm easy to find Scott Cohen. Jukebox is easy to find jkbx.com. Um, I found it. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to launch soon. Um, so that's why I, you know, not everything's in place yet. Awesome. Scott, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a blast. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hey, Scott, let's just stay right here and record again. And you can say jkbx.com. Uh, Scott, if people want to find out more about Jukebox, where do they go? jkbx.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, Scott. It's been amazing. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know you can dig deeper into all our episodes with the show notes at musictectonics.com. While you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference, sign up for our newsletter to get updates, or get the Music Tectonics app for music tech news. Everything we do explores seismic shifts that shake up music and technology, the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and find me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it, on LinkedIn. Bye-bye! You're listening to Music Tectonics.